The Axe Murdering Teacher, 1892. It was early in 1892, just outside of the small town of Fall River in Massachusetts, USA, at the Borden's family farm, there was a scene of a brief but deadly cold-hearted killing spree. For in the barn lay the beheaded bodies of a dozen or so innocent victims, all killed by the farm owner, retired 70-year-old banker Andrew Borden. His wife Abby and one of his daughters Emma were practical farming folk and understood the need for the killing, having themselves regularly slaughtered chickens and pigs for the dinner table. So this killing to them was no different and they busied themselves collecting the bodies ready to be cleaned up and made into pies. But Andrew's other daughter, Lizzie, was much more sensitive about seeing her beloved pigeons being slaughtered. For she had raised them since they had been born, more as pets, unlike others who simply saw them as yet another food source on the farm. Lizzie and her father had never been close and she had always resented him for marrying a woman called Abby Gray a few years after her mother's death. Lizzie's relationship with her stepmother, Abby, had deteriorated even further when she had found out that her father had bought several properties in secret. What distressed Lizzie was that the benefactor was her stepmother at the expense of herself and her sister, Emma. A house was even purchased for Sarah Gray Whitehead, Abby's younger half-sister. A few months later, there would be more slaughter at the Borden farm. On the morning of August 4th, 1892, Lizzie was in the barn and heard a strange noise from the house. She rushed into the house and into the sitting room. What she saw was truly horrifying. Lying dead on the couch was her father, his face badly disfigured as someone had struck him several times with a hatchet killing him almost instantly. Lizzie then summoned the maid, Bridget Sullivan, but didn't let her go into the sitting room, feeling that the sight of her dead father would be too much for the young maid. Earlier, Lizzie's 64-year-old stepmother had told Bridget that she was out visiting a sick friend, but she was found shortly after Mr. Borden's body was discovered. She was lying face down in the guest room upstairs. She had also been murdered having been savagely hacked to death from behind with a hatchet. But what was noticeable about her death compared to her husband's was it had been much more violent and intense, as if the assailant had hated the victim, something that was later brought up at the murder trial. And the hatchet, thought to have been used to kill both victims, may have in fact been the same one used by Lizzie's father to kill her much-beloved pigeons a few months earlier. The police investigated and put together the following timeline. The timing of the deaths were most odd. The medical examiner concluded that the stepmother was killed from behind at around 9 a.m. while cleaning the guest room floor. But the father was not killed until about 11 a.m. He had arrived home at approximately 10.45 a.m. unexpectedly, having been out on business most of the morning. He had then gone into the sitting room to take a nap. Lizzie discovered her murdered father at 11.10 a.m. It did strike the police as strange that in such a small three-story house, nothing untoward was seen or heard as going on by either Lizzie or the maid the whole morning. Yet two people who had been brutally murdered went unnoticed by the pair of them. The maid's explanation for this was that she had spent the entire morning cleaning the outside of the house on the instructions of the stepmother, Mrs. Borden. She was then resting from her duties in the third-floor room. While Lizzie claimed she was in the barn searching for lead sinkers for an upcoming fishing excursion, the police did carry out a search of the house but later admitted that it was only a cursory inspection and they did not carry out a thorough search until two days later on August 6th. At the inquest into the deaths, the medical examiner noted Mr. Borden had been killed by being struck at least nine times with a hatchet one blow slicing through his eyeball. The stepmother had been killed by 17 deeper, more intense blows to the back of her head. Lizzie's testimony at the inquest was all over the place, making little sense, and she contradicted herself continually. Also, some of the things she said were simply not true, like she said she helped her father put on his slippers before he took his faithful nap. 
but the crime scene photographs clearly showed him still wearing his shoes. On August 11, 1892, the police arrested Lizzie based on her confused answers at the inquest and on the fact that she had the most to gain from the death of her father and stepmother. Her father was a wealthy man, and with the stepmother dead, the two sisters stood to inherit a small fortune. The trial of Lizzie Borden began in June 1893 and became a national sensation. At one stage during the trial, both victims' skulls were admitted as evidence, forcing the proceedings to halt temporarily as this gruesome sight had caused Lizzie to faint. But there was no solid evidence that Lizzie committed the murders, and to the community she had a spotless character, teaching Sunday school. Lizzie was also the treasurer and secretary of the local branch of the Christian Endeavor Society, which helped to promote the society's message of leading an earnest Christian life among its members. So with her being so highly respected in the community, the jury had no problem finding her innocent. Lizzie never left Fall River. Her and her sister moved into a modern house in the wealthy neighborhood of The Hill. She died 35 years later of pneumonia on June 1, 1927. Her younger sister, Emma, died a few days later of a kidney disease. Neither ever married. The press and investigators never stopped hounding Lizzie, who mostly were convinced that she had carried out the murders. No one else was ever tried for the crime, and to this day, it's officially seen as an unsolved case. So who did murder Andrew and Abby Borden on that fateful morning in 1892? The suspects are as follows. The older daughter, Emma Borden. At 36 years old and a spinster, Emma was unlikely to find a husband in an era where women were normally married off by their early 20s. Could it be that she was fearful of her stepmother inheriting everything if her father died? meaning she faced an old age of abject poverty as she had neither a profession nor a husband to support her? So maybe she had a possible motive. But at the time of the murder, she had an alibi. She was visiting friends 15 miles away, and also her character was seen as impeccable. The resentful 25-year-old maid from Ireland, Bridget Sullivan? Abby Borden was very strict, and some would say she was mean when it came to how she treated her maid. Insisting on the day of the murder that Bridget cleaned the outside of the house thoroughly, despite the maid's protest that she was ill and that it was in the middle of a particularly bad heat wave. Could it be she simply snapped and brutally killed Abby in a rage and later the father in order to cover up her crime? The highly respectable 32-year-old younger daughter, Lizzie Borden. Did the police get it right in the first place, but didn't have enough evidence to prove it was her? It is true Lizzie had much to gain from the death of her father and stepmother. For if her elderly father died, her stepmother was due to inherit his vast fortune, and Abby had many relatives. On top of this, Andrew Borden, despite his wealth, was frugal. The Borden house lacked indoor plumbing and electricity while Andrew's cousins lived on The Hill, a neighborhood for the wealthy which he could easily afford to live. Could it be that Lizzie feared she would never get her hands on what was rightfully hers? Would she go to any lengths possible to live on The Hill? But if Lizzie had carried out both the murders, did she change out of a blood-stained dress twice? Or did she walk around for nearly two hours in a blood-stained dress, which seems inconceivable? But the fact of the matter was that the police didn't search the house properly for evidence until two days later, giving Lizzie plenty of time to get rid of any incriminating evidence. It is true that Lizzie was found in the kitchen by her sister and family friend burning what Lizzie claimed to be an old paint-stained dress. This may seem incriminating, but we must bear in mind that this was the morning of August 7th, the day after the house had been thoroughly searched by the police for evidence. Could it be that Lizzie's explanation regarding burning the dress was the correct one? And as for her shambolic and contradictory statements at court, can it be simply due to the side effects of the morphine she had been prescribed by her doctor at the time for stress and anxiety? There is another theory it might have been manslaughter from diminished responsibility. As Lizzie's mother had suffered from seizures that made her violent and go into uncontrollable rages, which she had no recollection of afterwards, 
It is said that Lizzie suffered from this too, but it seems hardly possible that if this was true, she had an episode that lasted over two hours. Could it be a relative? Then there was the strange case of Lizzie's maternal 59-year-old uncle, a Mr. John Vinicum Morse. The night before the murders, he had arrived unexpectedly with no luggage at the Borden's house. This wasn't unusual as he often arrived unannounced like this to discuss business with his brother-in-law, Andrew. It is said that despite the heat, he would wear the same clothes for two days at a time. Uncle John left the next morning to visit some nephews and nieces, returning later that day after the murders had been committed. The police considered him a suspect for a while, as his alibi at the time of the murders seemed just too perfectly detailed and rehearsed. Also, it didn't help that he once trained as a butcher and seemed to be quite emotionally unaffected by the murders, but the police concluded that he was just very eccentric and cold-hearted. There was also the inescapable fact that his alibi, being several miles away at the time of the murders, checked out. So the police dismissed him being a possible suspect and continued to look at other suspects. Was it a murderous intruder? The farm was secluded and the family were well known to be rich, so an opportunist thief was not too far-fetched a notion. Murdering one of the residences in the area might make sense if the thief had been discovered. But for the murderous thief to hide and wait for two hours and then kill the returning husband, but not the two other women in the house, does seem far-fetched. Even so, it was known that Andrew Borden was quite an unpopular man in town and had made many enemies in his business dealings. Was it a serial killer? Five days before the trial, a local woman was hacked to death with a hatchet in her kitchen by a Portuguese immigrant named Jose Correa de Mello. She had been struck 23 times to the head. Jose was later convicted of the woman's murder. The prosecution believed it was a burglary gone wrong. Even though it must have seemed strange to have two murders so close together in such a small town, nobody thought there was a link between the two cases. Despite the murder sharing similarities such as being committed in broad daylight and the murderer entering and leaving unseen. It is worth noting that Jose, according to official records, didn't come to America until after the Bordens were murdered. Was it a combination of people? Could it be that Lizzie had an accomplice? Could her accomplice have been the maid? And could they have carried out the murder together with Lizzie paying her off with her inheritance? It is true that Bridget left the family employment shortly after the murders, but accounts differ regarding what happened to her next. Some say she found employment elsewhere and eventually married, while another more tantalizing account was that she suddenly and mysteriously came into a large amount of money and was never to be heard of again. An intriguing combination of people and events? Could it be that Abby was killed by an intruder or serial killer who then fled or left the scene? Whereupon Lizzie, seizing the opportunity, murdered her father, later hoping to blame it all on the other murderer. It might seem far-fetched, but maybe Lizzie was desperate enough to carry out such a fiendish plan. Again, not realizing that science had advanced far enough to figure out the time of the two deaths were two hours apart. Could it be that Lizzie hired someone to do the killings? This would account for the fact there was no bloodied dress or that no killer was ever found. With her father and stepmother dead, she could easily pay off her accomplice quite handsomely. The case remains nearly 130 years later, unsolved. At the time of the trial, public opinion was that Lizzie was innocent. But soon enough, the public turned against her. And this can be best summed up by a popular children's skipping rope rhyme at the time. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. <laughs> <laughs> 